everyone. Final lecture, week seven, lecture one. Let's talk about chi-square tests and other non-parametric statistics. So when do you use non-parametric statistics? Well, when you do not have interval or ratio dependent variable. That's one case where you would use non-parametric statistics. The other one is where your data violate the assumptions for the parametric tests that you originally wanted to use and you end up having to instead use non, the non-parametric equivalent of uh, a parametric test. So uh, remember the, the matrix of inferential statistics. Um, the bottom row is parametric, so the non-parametrics are the other two rows. The one directly above each parametric test is its backup test in case things go poorly. So we're really only going to cover two of the non-parametric tests in depth, uh, but you should know that these other ones exist as backups in case you get into a problem situation. So they're kind of like weed whacker tests. The way I describe it is they're kind of odd but they work even in situations where parametric tests fail. So like you violate the assumptions for the parametric test, you can always do the non-parametric equivalent. And to me, it's kind of like parametric tests are like mowing your lawn where, you know, uh, you, it, it's smooth, it's easy, it looks good. Um, but you know, if your lawn is too tall, you can't use the uh, lawn mower. So you gotta weed whack it. And non-parametric tests are kind of like weed whackers. You can weed whack anything bushes, tall lawns, whatever, but it's not pretty. It doesn't look as good. So let's talk about one of these non-parametric tests, the chi-square goodness of fit test. Use it when you have frequency counts for only one nominal or categorical variable. It's got two or more levels, and you want to know whether the frequency in each level differs from some expected distribution, which usually, usually is equal frequencies across all the levels. Everything is equally the same. So some examples are some sizes of Starbucks, tall, grande, venti, purchased more often. Are they all purchased the same? Are patients at a treatment center more often referred by a particular source from the county, the courts, or private therapists? Just comparing counts across these things. How about uh, out of three possible answer choices on a test, A, B, and C, to test whether each is equally likely to be the correct answer? So the assumptions of chi-square goodness of fits, independence, that is, each person's in your study only once. Um, the expected frequencies for each category is at least one, otherwise get rid of that category. Um, and the third is no more than 20% of the categories have an expected frequency less than five. So weird assumptions, but none of these have to do with normality or linearity or any of that kind of stuff. They're just weird assumptions. Your hypothesis where f equals a frequency, the null is that the frequency of group one or level one is equal to two, is equal to three, et cetera, et cetera. There uh, is no significant difference between the observed frequencies and what would be expected if the categories were all equally likely to occur. That's your null. Your alternative is that they're not all equal. There is a significant difference between the observed frequencies and what would be expected if the categories were all equally likely to occur. So it's saying basically all the categories um, in the null are equal to each other given, you know, up or down and a, a, an extra marshmallow in your lucky charms. The uh, alternative is saying, nope, they're not all equal. This isn't just chance. There's a difference. So this is an omnibus test. It tests, uh, compares all categories to, all, to each other at the same time. So it is one of those omnibus tests. So you know it, we're gonna have a post hoc test. When you reject the null, all you know is that, okay, well, at least one category has a higher frequency than at least one other, but it could be more than that. Could be two categories differed, could be they all differed. So you gotta do a post hoc test after rejecting the null to find the specific differences. Your decision rule for your chi-square is if a simp sig is less than 0.05, you reject the null. That means um, the frequencies are not all equal across the categories. If a simp sig is greater than 0.05, retain the null. The frequencies are basically equal, you know, for all intents and purposes. Your post hoc test, when you reject the null, is to look at these things called the residuals. So residuals are the difference between the observed and expected frequencies for a given category or cell. And that's where you figure out where the differences are. Bigger plus or minus residuals 
mean more important for the chi-square being significant. That's where your bigger differences are. Your measure of effect size is none. APA format for chi-square is this. Chi-square, degrees of freedom, uh, sample size, then the chi-square value rounded to two decimals. You've got to pick P less than or greater than 0.05 based on the asymp sig. So let's do one. Are the correct answers on the 10 forms of the DMV written driver license test equally distributed across possible answer choices A, B, and C? So basically, you know, is there really any logic to guess B, which is what people seem to always say, or are they all equally likely to be the correct answer? So that doesn't really prefer any advantage. So what would you expect, given that there's 360 total questions, what would you expect uh, the distribution to be over here on the right if the, uh, the null hypothesis is true. Well, you'd expect a third of them, a uh, third of the items to have uh, A, B, and C as the correct answer. That's 120, 120, 120, or 33, 33, and 33. So your hypotheses, uh, F1 is frequency of answer choice A, F2 is frequency of answer choice B, etc. Your null is that the frequency for A is equal to the frequency of B equals frequency of C. Basically, each, each uh, category is equally likely to be the correct answer. Your alternative is that, nope, they're not all equal. At least one differs. There's the actual frequencies, 105, 142, and 113. Hmm, those aren't all 120, but are they different enough for us to go, yeah, something, uh, something is funky. <laughs> um, one of these answer choices is the correct answer more than expected. So um, they're not all 120. So could this just be chance or did DMD mess up and make B 39.4% the correct answer more often than A or C at 29.2 and 31.4. So here is our chi-square goodness of fit uh, test results. Those are observed ends again. Can we reject the null? That answer choices A, B, and C were equally likely within reason to be the correct answer on the DMV written test. There's our sig for our chi-square. That is uh, our decision rule is if A sim sigs less than 0.05, reject the null. However, if your A sim sigs greater than 0.05, retain the null. Well, 0.042 is less than 0.05, not by much, but it is, so we'll reject the null hypothesis. Our post-talk test is to look at the residuals. So since we rejected the null, we know that the answer choice frequencies are not equal across categories. So now we look at these residuals. We look where we have big numbers that are pluses or minuses, and that tell you where the differences are. So what do you see? There's negative 15 A's, 22 more B's, and seven fewer C's. So basically, the correct uh, choice B was the correct answer more often than expected and choices A and C less often than expected. So, you know, if you don't know the answer on DMV's test, guess B, there's logic to that. So our measure of effect size, there isn't one. <coughs> APA format, there's the general form. There it is all filled in. Where does stuff come from? There's your degrees of freedom right from the table. N is the total sample size. There's our chi-square value rounded to two decimals, and P was less than 0.05. So the take home, if you don't know the answer, guess answer choice B. So this is real data. So let's talk about one more chi-square test, the chi-square test of independence. When do you use this one? Well, when you have frequency counts again, but you have two or more nominal slash categorical variables. So each of those has to have at least two levels, otherwise they're not a variable. And you want to know if the variables are independent or they're related. So some examples. In a survey of adolescent females and males, there's nominal variable one. Is there a difference in their self-perception of body weight, which is underweight, normal, or overweight? Another variable. So does perception of body weight depend on the sex of the respondent? is the question answered. So it will look at whether males and females were equally likely to rate themselves as underweight, normal weight, or overweight. This is technically ordinal. How about this one? Whether uh, were higher SES, socioeconomic status, um, passengers more likely to survive the Titanic disaster? Were passengers of different SES levels equally likely to survive the Titanic disaster, or did survival differ across SES levels? 
Hmm, what do you think? So the assumptions for chi-square test of independence are exactly the same as the other chi-square, so they're weird. The independence of cases in each level or group, so it's between subjects design, which is every person's only in your study once. The expected frequencies for each category should be at least one. And finally, no more than 20% of the categories can have an expected frequency less than five. So the hypotheses are weird for chi-square test of independence, along with the assumptions. They're written using words, not math. So your null is always something along the lines of the variables being studied are independent or not related. So for example, SES of Titanic passengers was not related to the survival. The alternative is the opposite. There is something, some relationship here. The variables being studied are dependent or they are related. So for example, SES of Titanic passengers was related to the survival. Jack and Rose, let's find out. So there are many ways to write these hypotheses, but make sure to always name the variables when you do this. So like SES and survival, don't just say the variables are related, the variables aren't related. Don't do that, grandma doesn't get that. You need to say um, the names of the variables when you do that. So note that this chi-square, also omnibus test, so it, it tests uh, uh, that hypothesis at one time, which usually involves multiple comparisons. If you reject the null, all you know is the variables are related somehow. Could be just two of the categories differ, could be they all differed. What do you gotta do? Post hoc tests, of course. Your decision rule. If your Pearson chi-square asymp sig is less than 0.05, reject the null. That means your variables are indeed related. However, if your Pearson chi-square asymp sig is greater than 0.05, retain the null. Nothing going on here. No relationship, SES was not related to whether you were you survived on the Titanic or not, for example. Post hoc tests, it's not residuals anymore, it's adjusted standardized residuals for each cell. They're basically these things that SPSS calculates for each cell in the design, and they're like z-scores of how much the observed frequency in a cell differed from expectation if the null hypothesis was true. So basically what we do is we treat them like any z-score. We look for ones that are two or bigger. And uh, two or bigger positive means there was more in that cell than expected if the null was true. The null being there's no relationship. Uh, uh, negative uh, adjusted uh, standardized residual. Uh, two or bigger tells you there is uh, fewer in that category than would have been expected if the null hypothesis were true. So we're going to use the adjusted standardized residuals to identify which cells had higher or lower percentages than would be expected if the variables were not related, which is what the null says. Your measure of effect size, there is one. Um, it's called Kramer's fee. It's actually V the, <laughs> in SPSS because they hate us. I, I honestly don't know why they use V. So uh, Kramer's V and uh, APA and SPSS. It comes straight from the SPSS output. You don't actually have to calculate it. It comes right on the output from SPSS. What to tell you? Not so shockingly, the percentage of variability in the frequency counts that could be accounted for by the relationship between the variables. APA format for your chi-square. There she blows. Um, the only difference from the goodness of fit is you got V on the end there. So let's do one. What do one would you want to do? Jack and Rose, you got it. So we're upper, upper, middle, and lower socioeconomic status. Passengers equally likely to survive on the Titanic when it hit the iceberg in 1912. What variables we got here? Well, we got um, one IV, that's your SES, right? Whether you're your, your passenger class, first, second, or third. So we use passenger class as a proxy for socioeconomic status because like Jack was down in third, which is where you were if you were um, uh, impecunious, so you didn't have a lot of money, and first is where Rose was, that's where the rich people were. So it's a proxy for SES. Our dependent variable here is survival, and the choices are you survived or you didn't. <laughs> Those are your two choices, so it's a nominal, true nominal variable. Hypotheses, remember they're in words, so the null is upper, middle, and lower SES passengers were equally likely to survive when the Titanic hit the iceberg. So that's a fancy way of saying there's no relationship between SES and survival. Your alternative, 
says there is some sort of relationship. Specifically, upper, middle, and lower SES passengers were not equally likely to survive when the Titanic hit the iceberg. Here's our, uh, this is called a cross tabulation. So it turns out that chi-square tests don't have their, or tests of independence do not have their own menu item. You get them under a procedure called cross tabs, which is under descriptives. And um, it gives you sort of, uh, it crosses the two variables. So you have first, second, and third class by died or survives. And you get a number, a percent, and an adjusted residual. All right, so here you got to get the right percentages. So here uh, we got column percentages. So because different uh, numbers of passengers on the Titanic were first, second, or third class, it's you have to sort of say, okay, within each class, what percent died? That that's the appropriate one, as opposed to um, of those who who died, what percent were first, middle, or third? Well. The, the, uh, there was always a lot more third class people, so they'll always have a higher percent. So the only way to do this is look at the percentage, the column percentages. So because if you compare the raw counts, it's not correct, right? You got different numbers of passengers. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me, for first class, 62.5% survived. Second class, 41.4% cla survived. Third class, where Jack was, um, about a quarter. So, whoa, those sure don't look equal, right? So the question is, uh, is that, could that possibly just be a couple extra marshmallows? Kind of not doubting it, but let's analyze it anyway. The test will tell us the likelihood you could get differences uh, by chance that are that big or not. So could they just be chance? Let's see. Here's our actual chi-square test of independence output. That line that says Pearson chi-square is our row we want. Can we reject the null that upper, middle, and lower SES passengers were equally likely to survive when the Titanic hit the iceberg? Pearson chi-square, our decision rule, if A simp sigs less than 0.05, reject the null. If A simp sigs greater than 0.05, retain the null. So remember the null says no relationship here between SES and survival. If we reject that, we know there is a relationship between SES and survival. Boom. Yeah, zero is less than 0.05. So there's clearly a relationship between SES and uh, survival. They are not independent. So our post hoc tests. Since we rejected the null, all we know is that passengers were not equally likely to survive across SES levels, which is a fancy way of saying SES and survival are related. So now what, what do we got to do? We got to do the post hoc test. We got to look at the adjusted standardized residuals to determine which SES levels were more or less likely to survive. That's in the cross tab table. So we're going to inspect the standard adjusted standardized residuals. Here they're just called adjusted residual. We're going to find cells where the absolute value of the adjusted residual is two or bigger, like because there's these scores. And um, we're going to see if they're negative or they're positive. If we see a positive, there's more people in that cell than expected. If it's negative, there's fewer. Um, <clears throat> where you have adjusted residuals that are less than two tells you, yeah, yeah, about as many people were in the cell as would have been expected if the null hypothesis were true. So survival is dichotomous. So you don't have to look at both died and survived percents in the adjusted standardized residuals. Just pick one. So we're going to look at survival. So looking at the standardized adjusted residual, which is the adjusted residual there, it's 10.5 and it's positive. So that tells us it's bigger than two. So that cell is funky. Specifically, it's positive. There's a higher percentage of first class passengers than uh, who survived than would have been expected if the null hypothesis were true, 62.5% of them. How about for second class? Well, the adjusted standardized residual there is not two or bigger, right? So about as many second class people survived as would have been expected if um, SES and survival were actually not related. So who died? Oh, well, what do you know? There's a negative adjusted residual for third class that's two or bigger, and it's negative. That tells you fewer third class people survived than would have been expected if uh, SES and survival were not related. So um, first class people lived, uh, lower class people, lowest class people died, middle class people died about 
or more, sorry, middle class people died about as much as you would have expected if the null hypothesis were true. Take that, Rose. Our measure of effect size, again, is Kramer's V, comes from the output Darcy blows, Kramer's V, 0.318, so about 0.32. So 32% of variability in survival on the Titanic could be predicted by what your uh, SES was, your, your stowage class. All right, APA formats, there's the general form, there's the table again, there's the information all filled out. Where'd it come from? Two degrees of freedom, total number of cases, or passengers, sorry, is 1316 on the Titanic. There's our chi-square rounded to two decimals, P was less than 0.05, and V comes from that symmetric measures table. So overall, what's it, what do you tell grandma? Well, you tell her higher SES passengers, 62.5%, were more likely to survive than lower SES passengers, 25.2%, but middle SES passengers at 41.4% survived at the expected rate. So there are some other non-parametric tests I just want to introduce briefly, just so you know about them. There's something called the Man Whitney U test. Notice that it's above the independent samples t-test. It's it's backup. It's a non it's a non-parametric test that's used to compare two independent groups of sample data, particularly if the DV is ordinal. It's also used if the DV was integral or ratio, but the data severely violated the homogeneity or normality assumptions for independent t. Are the sample sizes are really small and unequal. So it's basically the non-parametric equivalent of the independent t-test. One last one is called Wilcoxon's Match Pairs Signed Ranks Test. Um, that one is right above the paired sample t-test, so it is the backup you can use if you violate the assumptions for that test. It is a non-parametric test that's used to compare two dependent or paired groups of sample data, particularly if the DV is ordinal. It is also used, um, as we discussed, if you have interval or ratio DV, but the data severely violate the assumption, normality assumption, homogeneity assumption, or the sample sizes are really small, possibly. Can't be unequal if it's the same people, right? So it is the non-parametric equivalent of paired T. So we're not going to cover, but uh, know that there is a Kreskel Wallace H test, which is the backup for one-way repeated measures ANOVA, and know that the Friedman ranks test is the non-parametric equivalent of the repeated measures ANOVA, just in case you need it in the future. So that's it. Last lecture. Uh, give it a shot. Try those chi squares. You're going to do the hoopty hoopty car rental and post any problems you have in the discussion.